I would like to start off my new year with a few short books. Oh, it just makes me feel like I've sort of uh, hit the ground running and make, like I'm making progress, you know, on my reading. Um, so a lot of the books that I'm going to talk about in this wrap-up are short, but the except for the first one, which is quite long, and one of the books I'm currently reading is quite long. But uh, I want to talk a little bit about the books that I have read, and then uh, rattle off quickly some of the books that I'm currently reading. I don't want to go into too much depth about those, uh, because I want to do individual videos about all of them. So the first book that I finished in 2020 was Ulysses by James Joyce. And uh, I, I also read the new Bloomsday book by Harry Blay Myers, which is just a page by page, <coughs> excuse me, page by page summary and sort of kind of analysis of what's going on in Ulysses at every at every point in in the book. And I did do a whole video about Ulysses, so I won't go on and on about it here. But I will just say that if you're intimidated by Ulysses, then having a, something like the, the the new Bloomsday book, or even just reading along with the Spark Notes, can make it go down much much easier. Um, so I would just make that recommendation uh, if you're not willing to just jump in headfirst and go through it blind like some people do and some people enjoy. Um, but anyway, I'll leave a link to my video that I did on Ulysses uh, if you're curious to check it out. The second book that I finished in 2020 was this, uh, Letters to a Christian Nation by Sam Harris, which was published in 2006. Um, many of you, I'm sure, will know of Sam Harris as uh, one of the four horsemen of New Atheism, along with Christopher Hitchens, uh, Daniel Dennett, and Richard Dawkins. I had my doubts going into this because I tend to find the New Atheists um, incredibly uh, patronizing and condescending, and I also think that their idea of what religion is and is very limited, and I think that they lack literacy with regards to religious history. But what was, and th so this book is just sort of a, another one of those basic um, attacks on religion, specifically Christian religion, specifically in America. Um, and he just lays forth a lot of his basic criticisms of religion. Um, and what I found refreshing about this versus the other new atheists who I have encountered is that Sam Harris actually acknowledges that his conversation about religion really focuses pretty much entirely on religious fundamentalism and doesn't really speak so much to liberal religion or to moderate re religion. So I found that incredibly refreshing that he, he openly says at the beginning of this book that he is addressing religious fundamentalists and that really he's not attacking uh, all religious people. So I, so I really liked that. And I will say that a lot of his criticisms of religious fundamentalism are uh, are not new or original by any means, but they are articulated really well. They are articulated in such a way that they seem self-evident, and some points of this book are incredibly eloquent as well. It's also surprisingly succinct. I mean, he covers a lot of ground in this tiny book. Um, and so I was actually thinking that maybe I've actually found uh, a, a new atheist writer who I sort of kind of like. Um, but then at the very last minute uh, of the book he dumps a whole mound of Islamophobia into his into his writing and uh, yeah he just lost me there so unfortunately I can't quite recommend this book. Um, yeah it, it was a really disappointing to get that far and think wow this actually is pretty good and then to have that happen. So yeah not a huge fan of that one. But I am a huge fan of this next one. This was a reread. I uh, am buddy reading a bunch of Euripides uh, with Mark over at Words, Words Everywhere, Roz over at Scally dandling about the books. Uh, I think I have her channel name down. Uh, and Madeline over at Made with Books. Um, and we're just reading one play per month. Uh, I think uh, in Feb for February we're going to be reading um, the Medea. So looking forward to that. But for the for January we read the Trojan Women, which is the story of the aftermath of the fall of Troy, um, after the whole uh, you know Trojan horse affair, um, and after Troy has been conquered, um, what happens in the aftermath, specifically to the women involved, um, Andromache, the wife of Hector. Uh, Hecuba H Hector's mother is still alive, um, and many other women are still alive, and this just follows them I in the wake of the Greeks' victory. And I feel like I could do an entire video on the Trojan women. Uh, actually, Rods over at S Scantily Dandling About the Books sort of did a whole video about about the Trojan women, uh, where she talked about it alongside a bunch of a bunch of other Greek myths and also modern adaptations of Greek myths. Um, I'll, I'll try to remember to leave a link to her video because it is superb. Um, but I will just say that I think what is incredibly powerful about it is just how uh, the 
victims of war, the people who are left alive after war has ended, specifically on the losing side, are often, um, often they just want to sort of bear the pain that they're in at that point. But they're so often seen as threats by the victors. Um, and you see that in particular with the treatment of Astyanax, who is the son of the very young, like two year old son of Hector, um, who is seen as a threat despite being, you know, a two year old boy who has no idea what's going on. And I think that that is particularly powerful in this book in a few different manifestations. Um, and that is to say that the book is that the play is in large part about victim blaming, I think. And uh, it's incredibly compelling on that. So, uh, yeah, if you haven't read Euripides uh, and you're thinking about, like, getting into ancient literature or the old Greek playwrights, then you really can't go wrong starting with him. The next book I finished was returning to uh, the nonfiction and returning to the modern world. This is South and West by Joan Didion. This was, this was just published in 2017, so go me for reading a book that recent. Um, but this is sort of a this, uh, what this book is, is it's a transcript of a notebook that uh, Joan Didion kept way back in the 70s when she was in, uh, traveling around um, the South, uh, specifically in uh, Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama, I believe. And she was supposed to be working on a piece for a magazine at that time. Um, and the piece never got written, but she wrote all these notes um, and at some point just decided to put them together into a book. And uh, the second part about the West uh, is just sort of an essay about growing up in California. So it's just kind of full of rambly observations about Southern society and this culture in the South and such. Um, and I found that pretty interesting, the discussion of the South. I was, I was born and raised in uh, upstate New York, uh, so for me the South still seems almost like a foreign country. I mean, I've been to I've been to Arkansas, but while I was there, I sort of didn't interact with many people who were actually like Arkan natives of Arkansas. Uh, and my brother lives in Texas, so I feel like I sort of have the measure of Texas, but the Texas is also a lot different from places like uh, from Louisiana and, you know, Mississippi and Alabama. So it really was interesting to get these observations about Southern society and specifically kind of how preoccupied Southerners, at least were at the time she was writing in the 70s, um, were with, um, you know, social class and race and uh, etiquette and stuff like that. Very sort of old-fashioned aristocratic. She also has a lot of interesting uh, commentary on the sort of subtle and casual sort of racism that was endemic to the South again at the time, although perhaps perhaps still today and perhaps maybe not as subtle today now that we have our current president, but no more on that. Um, so I found that pretty interesting. The second part of the book that's about the West was so short, it was only like 15 pages that I really didn't feel like I was able to get anything out of it, so I didn't particularly care for it. Um, so yeah, I really love the way Joan Didion's mind works, I like her writing, um, and I did find this book interesting. Although I wouldn't exactly call it a must-read. The last book that I finished this month was American Indian Stories by Zit Kalasa. This uh, volume was published in 2019, but these pieces were all written probably in the early 20th century, I'm going to guess, because Zit Kalasa died in uh, 1936. Um, but this is a, a part of the Modern Library Torchbearers series, and this is just a collection of essays and poetry and short stories by Zit Kalasa, who was a Sioux activist, politician, musician, uh, and writer, of course. The essays in here are very memoiristic. They really do focus mostly on her life growing up on a Sioux reservation, and then later on going, being taken to a boarding school, getting sort of, you know, quote-unquote civilized by, in, by white instructors who were often, you know, abusive and uh, were trying to engage in cultural genocide. Um, and the short stories kind of tell similar stories in different contexts about especially young Native Americans who kind of feel this sense of adriftness where, um, you know, they have been... Uh, kind of, again, quote-unquote, civilized by white people, but still not accepted by white people fully. Um, but at the same time, don't quite feel at home in their, you know, native nation among their friends and family because they've been changed so much by their experience at these boarding schools. Um, and that came through in both her own stories, her story of her own life, and in her short stories. And I thought that this volume was particularly interesting on that because it, it is an experience that I think 
often is not discussed that much. I think we, we talk a fair amount about the boarding school system when we discuss Native American issues, but we don't necessarily always talk about what happened after uh, a, a young Native American left the boarding schools, if they made it out of the boarding schools. A lot of, a lot of Native Americans died in boarding schools, uh, actually. Um, but if they were lucky enough to make it out, um, then their suffering wasn't done because they were sort of left in this weird position where they really weren't, didn't quite feel at home among their native nation, but they also weren't accepted by white society. And so I think this volume is interesting on that. The poetry in here is not particularly good, I have to say, but if you're interested in Native American issues, especially in the late 19th and early 20th century, this might be an interesting volume for you. And uh, now finally to uh, rattle off some of the books I'm currently reading. Um, one book that I am hoping to finish tomorrow is The Song of the Lark by Willa Cather, which was published in 1915, and which is my first Willa Cather, so I'm looking forward to doing a review video of that one. It's about a young girl named Thea Kronborg, who is born and raised in this small town in Colorado, but is very musically talented and dreams of being a great singer, and uh, this is about her sort of rise to success as a singer, um, and I, I'm, I am enjoying it. Um, and then I'm also reading uh, The Land of Green Plums by Hertha Müller. Uh, Hertha Müller uh, won the Nobel Prize in Literature, I believe, in 2009. She is a German writer who was Romanian-born, but also was born among a German minority living in Romania, so she grew up speaking German. Um, but anyway, this book was originally written in German, um, and it was translated uh, by Michael Hoffman. And uh, anyway, I'm reading this uh, in part just because it's a book that's been on my shelf for a long time, but also in part because uh, uh, Mel over at Mel's Bookland Adventures and Britta Bowler have started a, um, a project to read more German books in 2020. And this is a book that was originally written in German, so I'm reading it for that as well. Um, but anyway, again, I want to do a whole video about it. I am finding it very interesting. Another book that I just started this week is Blue Nights by Joan Didion which is uh, kind of her follow-up to The Year of Magical Thinking, uh, a lot about her relationship with her daughter and her experience in the wake of her daughter's death not too long after her husband also died. And uh, I, I am loving it. I, again, want to do a whole video about it, but it is absolutely beautiful. And then finally, a book you're probably going to be seeing me wave in front of you for a long time because it's going very slowly, but well, it is really, really good is Team of Rivals, uh, The Political Genius of Abraham Lincoln by Doris Kearns Goodwin. Um, yeah, this is the story of uh, obviously Abraham Lincoln, but also um, four of his associates who, uh, and their their names are William Seward, Salmon Chase, Edward Bates, Ed and Edwin Stanton. And they were all kind of rivals to Lincoln uh, in the lead up to the 1860 election. They were all rivals for the uh, nomination for the Republican Party for their pre presidential nominee. Um, but then they had to work together. Once, once a Lincoln was elected, they had to sort of work together. And this is the story of all five of those men, kind of uh, biographies of all of them and their political careers. And um, so, you know, it's a story of America in the 19th century. It's a story of the Civil War. It's a story of slavery. Um, and uh, I'm buddy reading it with Patrice Jones, and we're just over 200 pages in, and we're both really, really liking it. But we're having to take it slowly, because it is... It is quite packed with information, and you know, it's a, this is a big book, I don't know if you can see how big it is, um, and, uh, yeah, so it is slow going, but we are both really, really enjoying it, uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I can already, I already feel like I can recommend it, even though I'm only, I'm only, you know, 200 pages in, and it's like almost 800 pages long, um, and then two last books to talk about quickly, um, I've been perusing the major works of Samuel Johnson, and, uh, I just always, his prose is always a delight, it is just a, a uh, British 18th century pomposity to it that is just so um, authentic in a way. And also, I mean, if there's anyone who has a right to be pompous, had a right to be pompous, it was definitely Samuel Johnson, because, I mean, he had basically read everything and was a brilliant man, so, I mean, I mean, he was a flawed guy, I know. I, I know he, he could be an unsavory human being, but he was a really smart guy, and I love his writing. Um, and then finally, something that I've started to poke into is... Uh, a, cl a classical music lover's companion to orchestral music. Um, and uh, so this is by Robert Phillip. And I read the entry about uh, Gustav Mahler's uh, Third Symphony, and I read it while I was listening to the symphony. And just from doing that, I could tell that this book is just going to be invaluable. Um, it was just so delightful to follow along with the music with what he has to say about it. Just, you know, 
I mean, I can appreciate music just by listening to it and letting it wash over me, but having someone to sort of help you along and point out different themes and motifs that occur um, is just really helpful. And also to sort of place the piece of music in the wider context of the composer's body of work is really great as well. Um, so yeah, I think I'm going to really, really like this uh, as I sort of slowly make my way through it. Um, so anyway, that is my uh, mid-month wrap-up. I, uh, you know, as always, I invite uh, you to give your thoughts on any of the books uh, that I've held up or anything that I've said. Um, and uh, I always look forward to your comments. Uh, and I will see you pretty soon in my next video. So, bye guys.